From shallow water reefs to the mysterious deep, OceanX is on a mission to explore the ocean and bring it back to the world. Here are some of the um, weirdest things we've encountered in the sea. The Red Sea encompasses something in the range of 4,000 dugongs, but they are difficult to find, difficult to photograph. It's not like dolphins that jumps in front of the boat and just <laughs> plays with you. They are very shy. They are mysterious, and with all these legends and stories told from the past, these kind of magical animals. Usually you don't develop legends for something that you know very well. <laughs> because legend is imagination, and imagination fills the gaps of knowledge. That makes me like attracted to this mysterious animal. But I worked in the Dugun and the conservation in Duguns long time before my first sighting of the Dugun. It's very, very like emotional feeling when I saw them for the first time indeed. If you want to enjoy the beauty of the, the sea, you need to pretend that you are a marine creature. When, when the other creatures accept you as a friend, this is when you see everything natural. So the more that you blend within, within this group, the more that you can see things as normal as they are. It's like, like uh, quite a music. Especially when there is like some waves and some currents indeed, I mean, just this kind of like music blending with the feelings. You should think and behave like a dugong, to understand dugong so that you can find them. Dugongs are not easy to find. You need first to understand what dugongs looks for. Look into the sea grass in the eyes of dugongs. There are a lot of decisions that the dugongs make while grazing. They look for the best of the best of seagrass. Now they are very selective if they have the chance to be selective. How to maximize my energy intake by grazing the best of the seagrass? Or should I graze it one time and leave to another meadow so that I don't overgraze this meadow and keep it for the future? When I looked at the sea grass, it's a very simple plant that it grows in the, in the seabed. When I looked at the dugong, it's a very simple animal just grazing the sea grass. But when I look, the reaction, interactions between these two, I mean, how dugongs graze the sea grass and how the sea grass will respond. People think it's very simple, but it's much more than that, indeed. There is increasing pressure put on the dugongs and on their habitat, and this is alarming. But I am hopeful. Because when people get in love with the dugongs, they will definitely understand the importance of protecting and conserving their feeding grounds and habitats. I am hopeful indeed for conservation.
We'd been driving for eight and a half hours across this barren, abyssal plain. And I felt incredibly guilty because all of the effort had gone into finding nothing. And something changed in the far distance. It looked a little bit murky, and I remember the seafloor was getting darker. And we were starting to approach the wall from the coastline at that point, and I thought, oh, we must now be at the end of the dive, and we've failed. But the image got slightly darker, and then as we got closer, there was little bits of seaweed which have washed down from the shallows, but they were floating just above the seafloor in a really weird way. And then the lights from the ROV cast down, and you could see the bow wave from the ROV propagating out across the brine pool, and it was the most beautiful thing. And I remember the first thing I felt was relief. <laughs> Oh my goodness. That's you doing the wave, right? Oh, that's awesome. Anything that goes in there doesn't move. Yeah, yeah. Are you sure that already is in the bottom? Yeah, it's like a giant. The CTD was the only way that we could get samples of the water back to the surface and also measure the chemical properties of the brine. And we had to have the CTD and the ROV down at the same time because we were using the ROV to see what was going on. And there was a lot of trepidation because they're both tethered to the ship by cables nearly a mile and a half beneath the ship and there's an incredibly high chance that they're going to get tangled and cause the loss of the ROV, the loss of the CTD, or both. So what we did is we lowered the ROV down and rested it on the brine because the brine is so dense. And once we'd got that positioned, we could give the signal visually of when to trigger the water sample. So the first sigh of relief was when the CTD appeared in the video coming from the ROV, because we knew that it made it down that far without getting tangled. But then to guide it down literally centimeter by centimeter, very slowly to make this very precise point, and then actually seeing the bottle snap close with the water inside it, it was a huge relief. It was very exciting because I don't think this has ever been done before in such a precise way. There's a lot of life around the brine pool and even within it, and it doesn't seem to be coincidence. It seems that organisms have learnt about the brine and are using it to their advantage. So there were these huge armies of shrimp which live on the rocks looking down into the brine, and it seems that when anything goes into the brine by accident, before the organism dies and sinks to the bottom of the brine pool where it's inaccessible, the shrimp rush in and snatch it from the brine surface, and they're using the brine as a trap. The reason why this is so special is that to get this sort of environment, you need hydrothermal activity. And if you're going to get hydrothermal activity, you need plate tectonics. And if Earth is one of the rare planets which has plate tectonics and that can produce such environments, it's conceivable that life in the universe is very rare indeed. Perhaps we're the only ones. And if we're going to go out into the universe and look for life elsewhere, we're going to be targeting uh, planets or moons like Europa around Jupiter, where we understand there's a hydrothermal circulation, and you might have brine pools very similar to what we're seeing right now. We nearly missed it. I mean, we were close to giving up. And it just goes to show that if you're at the bottom of the sea and you've got 15 minutes left, push on. It's a privilege. Take every single minute and every single second you've got because you never know what's around the corner. <laughs>